It is winning season at my bookie. Use promo code Gators on a deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly to your my bookie account. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I am your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. And if you're watching the YouTube version, you can see we got a full house here right on Gators Breakdown. Seth Bonador is going to join Will Miles and I taking a d- deep dive into this Florida offense. Bye week coming up. Big win uh, on, on the hills of that win versus South Carolina. So plenty to discuss on uh, what was a – a uh, great performance there by Graham Mertz going over 400 yards passing. Not, uh, we were talking beforehand. We didn't see that coming. Uh, and it no. was certainly needed for the Gators to get that come from behind fourth quarter victory over the Gamecocks. So won't waste much time before we get in that. Seth's limited on time tonight. So we'll pretty much get straight to it. Everybody like this video. Subscribe to Gators Breakdown on YouTube if you haven't done so yet. All that support goes a long, long way. So, well, what, what kind of kickstarted this? And Seth and I had talked uh, in the past about maybe during the bye week discussing the Florida offense. And hey, what a perfect time after that, after what we saw Saturday uh-huh. night. Uh, just some difference uh, in, in what we saw with this offense. So you can head to gatorsbreakdown.com and read Seth's latest Scheming with Seth title Gators Work Their Plan versus South Carolina, where he. He took a look at some key plays from the South Carolina game and dismisses a net, dismisses a narrative out there that's been floated out. Uh, and a quote in the article goes like this. Anybody who tells you that Florida is running a bunch of new passing concepts the past couple of weeks has not been, has not been paying close enough attention. Seth, there's the introduction. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's always I think the the difference, and I talked about it in the in the piece. Florida is a concept based passing team, so they have different concepts based on how many receivers are getting out in the route. They'll combine two sometimes. They'll, they'll, sometimes it'll be full field, and it'll be one call for everybody. Sometimes it'll be a call for one side and a different call for the other. Just because they combine two that maybe they haven't combined before doesn't mean this is a brand new passing game. It's the same concepts for the most part. Um, I thought with that in in mind, you also have game plan wrinkles. So going back and looking through the game, there was a few things that I think they've run before but didn't come to top of mind. But for the most part, there was wrinkles off things they've been running the whole time Napier's been here. Slot fade, they've been running that the whole time he's been here. Instead of running a hitch, they expected a ton of man coverage. They ran a slant, which is smart, right? You don't want to just run a hitch and have it die out there. You can run a delay slant, which I think they did a couple times as well. Um, But for the most part, it was concepts you've seen before. They executed them well. They had better guys running them than they had earlier in the year. And I think that's really what people are getting caught up is more on the result than what actual ha- actually happens. I don't. I didn't see much different in this game than I haven't seen the last year plus. And I went back and studied the whole passing game after last season, so I have a pretty good familiarity with what they like to do. And there wasn't a ton there that I saw was different. It's being executed better by better players. I mean, in some capacity, they had a couple of wrinkles, right? I mean, they had Trey Wilson in the backfield at one point with yeah. with Montreal Johnson as lead blocker. So, and then the little uh, um, the little flea flicker type of play that turned into a disaster. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> not like a that's not like a brand new. All they have that yeah. swing pass in the playbook already. That's not you know I mean that's not brand new. That's just a, that's a wrinkle. Right. And the well, I mean, uh, the, the the trick play, yeah, that may be new, but it's a game plan like weekly wrinkle. That's not something totally out of left field where they're changing stuff because it hasn't been working for the most part. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it'd probably be a negative thing if you're changing your entire yeah. past game, <laughs> uh, you know, four or five games into the year. I mean, look, I mean, Mertz has been, I, there, there was an emphasis on going downfield. You could tell that. Um, and whether that was something where they, like the, they showed the all 22 for the deep shot that he hit to uh, Khalil Jackson. 
And Jackson wasn't necessarily open when he made the decision to go to Jackson. It was something that, you know, I'm not sure that two or three weeks ago he would have taken that shot. So I think that sort of goes to what you're saying, though, Seth, right? They didn't change the structure of what they were doing, but the execution by Mertz and the receivers, or at least the trust that Mertz had in his receivers, um, seems to be advancing as the season's moved along. Yeah, they got a lot more man coverage, which I think they anticipated. So they had a good plan for it. And then the the throw to Jackson, I'm pretty sure it's the same exact concept they ran against Tennessee last year that you hit Pierce on a couple times, also hit Justin Shorter on, where they're making it look like he's going to bend to the middle of the field and then he breaks it back. But for the quarterback, it's a lot of the same things. I I agree. I thought Mertz, one thing, I thought he was a little more aggressive. Not just downfield. I thought he was kind of outside of the big play action shots where it's like his mind fries for a second. He was really decisive. I thought he threw the ball on time and was pretty aggressive in where he was throwing it. Just that I think that you can just look at that post shot he took to Mizell uh, to start off the the drive to kind of score the first touchdown they needed in the fourth quarter. I mean, that wasn't super open, but if you're aggressive and you can kind of hold the safety for a second, you can take that shot, and he did. So I wonder if they kind of told him to let loose a little bit and not worry. I, I felt like he was kind of worried about his reputation coming in at times this year, being really safe with the ball instead of sometimes you're going to have to make tight window throws. Like that's part of the game. Um, and if you, if you're kind of hesitant, that can really hurt you. So I, I thought he kind of unleashed it a little bit more, uh, but it wasn't a bunch of new stuff. It was the same stuff he's been running since he got here. Maybe he feels a little more comfortable with it. Uh, Seth, one well, last thought on Mertz before we move on. And of course, I think part of this is the inconsistent offensive line play. Uh, I'm getting more and more impressed with the off platform throws and, and throwing while he has to maneuver the pocket. He moved up in the pocket a good bit the, the, the other night versus South Carolina. You know, I, I'd love to kind of go into some of the same points there. I'd love to see a smoother attack, but I think the <laughs> offensive line may hamper that a bit. Uh, but hey, that's good on Mertz for not doing what we saw at Wisconsin and delivering good, safe throws in those instances. Yeah, I thought I, my favorite throw of the game, actually, and I said it, I just finished uh, recording the video. It's a long one because there's a lot of uh, a lot of consequential plays in this game. But my favorite throw of the game from him uh, was the third and 10. They ended up not scoring on the drive, but he works up the pocket and throws a strike on a dig route to Marcus Burke, I believe, to convert a third and 10. Uh, and he maneuvered the pocket really well. And then you look kind of towards the, the end of the game, the drives they needed. The biggest plays in those drives were him making plays out of structure, kind of moving outside the pocket and getting the ball out of his hands and not panicking, right? Getting the ball to Boardingham. He wasn't ideal, but he one-on-one makes the guy miss, gets the first down, and then having the wherewithal to know that Pearsall has got a one-on-one out there once I get outside of the pocket there, give him a chance to make a play. So he he's definitely improved. Um, he's still – there's something to be desired on these long play action shots. Uh, I think that's not all on him, though. There's some protection issues. But, you know, he played – he's been about as good as you could have expected, I think, and maybe even more than most people expected. And uh, he's had the talent, but he's just kind of putting it together a little bit. Uh, one part. Okay. I'll, I'll follow up here. One part. And Seth, you and I discussed this a little bit and he's come on the last two weeks and that is the emergence of a tight end threat or uh, all this boarding him. Have you noticed maybe with him and his, his performances that, that may be opening up the offense a bit more, maybe just his play alone, opening up the offense more. I don't know if the, so if the play calling is much different to now they they trust they they trust they have a tight end that can make some plays. So is the are, are the plays maybe more flowing in his direction? Of course the the stats <laughs> bear it out a little bit, but uh, it does seem like you know I, I wouldn't say it, it's not by accident that the offense looks like it's expanded a bit when now they look like they have a tight end they can count on. Yeah, I think he gives you some flexibility, right? I know I know when Napier's talked about it in the past, he's really emphasized his receiver background. Uh, he gives you some flexibility in terms of being able to split him out. You saw him split out and catch some slants. Uh, I think what he's been providing is some more uh, run after catch on some of these where he's he's running a shallow or he's, he's running a drag and they they hit him on the run and he's able to turn it up field and, and convert. And we saw that uh, definitely on that third and long against Vanderbilt where he make, makes a catch, turns up field, and, and is able to make a guy miss, break a tackle, and convert when you really needed it. Um, I think that's been kind of the biggest value because there's been 
the tight ends, they haven't thrown to them a ton previously, but those guys, that wasn't their strong suit. You saw a, a bit here and there. Uh, you saw Zipper last year catch some. Uh, but, you know, Xanders was kind of the main guy there, and he's not a guy that's going to catch and run very much. So I think having a guy there with that ability, um, especially as kind of the guy you can move around and, and flex out a little bit, uh, I think provides some much-needed flexibility. And then Hayden Hansen's done a really good job in his role where he's more of the dirty work guy, and but then he can get to the flat, get over the ball, use his big body. So I, I think having that definitely helps. But it hasn't, to me, it hasn't changed a ton of what they want to do. It's just when they do it now, instead of maybe catching it for a five-yard gain and getting tackled, he can catch it, turn it upfield, and turn it into 12-15. I think the big thing that you've noticed with Boardingham is the broken tackles, right? I mean, yeah. the, the, the throw out there on the fourth down and 11 – um, if he gets tackled, the whole narrative for this game is completely different. It's yes. Mertz. It's Mertz always checks the ball down, doesn't go downfield, you know, in critical situations. Like the whole narrative is different. Instead, Boardingham breaks that tackle, and I know he had ETN out there to block, but he cut the angle just right to where the defender could only get his hand sort of on his hip, but couldn't get down and actually ankle, you know, grab his ankle or grab his foot and trip him up, and then was able to get upfield and get that first down on the touchdown pass on that same drive. If he doesn't tip that ball to himself, I think the I think the defender behind it gets a pick and yeah. Mertz, there wasn't touch on that because he had to go over another, he had to throw it over a defender, threw it a little bit too hard. And it might've been a, just a backbreaking interception <laughs> if, if, if he doesn't tip that to himself. And then the, you know, the, the, the basketball the background, basketball yeah, background. Yeah, <laughs> well, and then the, the opening pl- or the opening drive, he hit him and you, you were talking about the run after the catch there, Seth, 24 yard explosive play to open up that first yeah. drive ends up being a touchdown. The key play on that drive was the 24 yarder to boarding him that sets everything up. And he had a couple of those, not just the one where he broke all the tackles, um, but on that exact same drive against Vanderbilt, he opened up with something very similar to the play that they yeah. hit for the 24 yards against, uh, against South Carolina. So I, I think you're right, Dave, in terms of him bringing something to the offense that's just different. And in many cases, it's you can dump the ball off and it's not, hey, we got six yards. It's <laughs> we have an opportunity to get 12 or 13. Yeah. And, you know, when's the last time we had a guy you could chuck it out to and just say, you know, he's going to break a couple of tackles. He's going to make them gang tackle him. And for as often as we've seen the Florida defense may really, you know, over the last five or six years, not gang up. And then you get a, an ankle tackle broken or something. And all of a sudden it turns into a big play to have a guy on Florida's offense who can do that's kind of exciting. Let's move the receivers, guys. And, hey, look, he's not a traditional number one. He's not your prototype number one. But Ricky Pearsall certainly is playing like a number one receiver uh, out there for the Gators. And, Seth, it's impressing me where, hey, look, defenses know this is Florida's guy. This is the guy they probably have to stop. Mertz has targeted him maybe when he even shouldn't have at that times this year. But he's still getting the receptions and making the difference for this Florida offense. Yeah, they do a good job moving him around. So you'll see him play outside. You'll see him play in the slot. Like when the 12 personnel stuff, he's he's more outside. He played in the slot. But uh, one thing I think they do a really good job of is they'll motion guys outside of him and really make the defense kind of dictate who's going to be covering him. You'll you see a few times in, in, in the South Carolina game, they would motion a tight end outside of the receiver. Sometimes it was Pearsall. And now you're one-on-one with a safety. And with as much man as South Carolina wanted to play in the game, you know, getting him matched up on a safety is, is going to be a win for you probably. So I think they do a good job moving him around. And then he's, he's you know, he's made some great catches this year in terms of catches in traffic. Um, he wins a ton. He's a good route runner. And Mertz is obviously have, has a really high comfort level with him. So I, I think, you know, you're, you're kind of matching a player with, kind of a good scheme around him and some and some guys that are getting open outside of him too so you can't really spend too much energy just on him uh when you got like an explosive guy like trey wilson there you gotta you gotta pay him some mind too i'm interested to see what he's gonna run in the 40 yard dash this year because I, I think the perception that he's a possession receiver or a route runner is probably kind of a misguided perception. I, when he came from Arizona State, the highlights that you all saw were ones where he was like returning kickoffs and he was an explosive player. Yeah. And that's what we've seen here, too. Now, we've seen the acrobatics, too. I mean, you got the jump man catch and then you got the catch that it, that was just I mean, when when Merch threw that ball, I was like, no way is he going to get that. <laughs> and he brings that thing in and you're like, oh, OK, that's. That's Pearsall. He's got the ability to manipulate his body to make those catches, and he's got really sure hands. But 
I think we're going to find when he runs his 40 yard dash, he's a lot faster. Like the, the plays I'm really thinking about are the, the opening play. I think it was against, it was against LSU last year for, no, the the first touchdown against Florida state where he was like five or 10 yards behind the defensive backs there for Florida state. And then there was a post that he ran in that game. It was really the last nice throw Anthony Richardson made in the first half against Florida state last year. And he, again, he got a step on Florida State's corner and actually really two or three steps on Florida State's corner made it really easy for Richardson to hit him. Now, the precision route running he did on that post or on the on the final sort yeah. of seam right down the seam, he made the guy commit outside, widened him out. And then that made it easy for Mertz to fit the ball in before the safety was able to get over. Um, so that sort of thing, that attention to detail does absolutely make a difference. But um, he's not a possession receiver. He's an explosive player. A lot of the explosives that Florida get comes from Ricky Pearsall. It's not like he's got 45 catches. He's averaging nine yards a catch. He's averaging something like 14 and a half <laughs> yards a catch. And I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my little, my little shot sheet here. I got four explosive passes to him out of the 10 explosives in the game for Florida. So they're hitting him down the field. And it's not just a matter of, I think him getting open. He wins the one-on-one battles. And yeah. every time you look up, he's behind the defensive back. Yeah. And, and, and Seth, we were talking about it too, in the, in the discord, you probably will extend on this too today. It's, you know, Florida against South Carolina was working that, that the fade. They were working the outside, you know, outside routes. And I think South Carolina, the, the guy was even in position for outside, and he bit on the outside <laughs> fake anyway. And, and Pearsall goes to the middle and, and catches a touchdown pass. So you do see with Pearsall this offense building on itself at, at, as well. Yeah. And I think to Will's point, I think Napier said that a few times like, hey, your guys are going to be shocked when you see what he runs like he napier's kind of has come out and said he's a little bit more explosive than you think uh but yeah he's i think he's difficult because he does have some explosion but he's a really good route runner he's really precise and i think he really understands the offense if you go back and look at i think it was the third and 10 florida's driving uh maybe just outside the red zone the one they get they get a holding call when mertz takes off right you can see pearsall kind of say something to napier on the sideline it looked like he maybe was talking about, hey, I think this spacing concept, which they were end up running on third and 20, pick up like 15. It looked like he was saying something to Napier, like, hey, hey, I think this is going to be there. Uh, so I think he's probably got a really good feel, too, for what they're doing. And, and you can see that with the way he runs right. He's, he's really he's really good at setting guys up. He understands where he needs to get to. He understands how to manipulate leverage. Um, and you saw that in South Carolina. They tried to play him a ton of man and and he was able to kind of continually get open. Seth, he's the number one receiver, but when this offense has looked at its best, wide well, receiver Trey Wilson's been out there I mean, at the beginning of the Tennessee game and we saw all the the plays he was getting towards his way. We've seen it last week. We've seen it this week since he's come back and it made a difference in this offense. Plainly, how is he helping this offense as such a young guy and the dynamic playmaker that he has shown himself to be so far? Yeah, he's just a different kind of dude that they they don't they got nobody else like him. I don't think Pearsall is as good as he is. He's not that kind type of guy, uh, run after catch guy. He's different. His acceleration is different. You could tell kind of the first time he touched the ball against Utah, it was oh this guy is he's different than anybody else they've got. Um, he he's he. I mean, he's elite run after the catch. It seems like every time he touches the ball, he's picking up eight yards. No matter where they give it to him, no matter who's around him, uh, he he's. It's unbelievable to watch him. He does some freaky things, and I think the more they can get it to him in space, and I, you can see that's a that's part of the plan. So um, I'm really interested to see uh, kind of where they go. Keep expanding his package and getting him more touches in creative ways because it certainly seems like that was going to be a big part of the plan before his injury, and then you kind of had to go through a few games there where maybe a really big part of your offense, bigger part than um, maybe most realized, was out. So uh, I'm excited to see how they use him in the future because he's just so dynamic, and I don't think you got you don't have anybody else like him. Maybe you haven't had anybody like him in a little bit. So, so I got a question for you then. If you know, as a former coach, what mm-hmm. are you adding next? Obviously, they put him in the backfield in this one. They've run, they had him actually run the reverse. They've run the jet sweep. Um, you know, they don't really have him out in a ton of routes that you can see. Like they're no. not throwing, you know, what do you add if you if you start putting in different wrinkles and you start adding different stuff? What are you what are you putting in the package next week? Or I guess you got two weeks now to put stuff in for Georgia. What do you think you show that you didn't that you haven't shown yet this year? I'd be interested to see if they expand on him 
uh, lining up at quarterback. They've done that twice now, I think. One time he kept it uh, and it ran like a sweep. Uh, the other time was the uh, the ill-fated uh, Philly special type uh, play. <laughs> it was the Philly not so special in this game. Uh, but I, I would be interested to see if they have more in that package with him there. Um, you know, I'm sure all these guys fancy themselves as quarterbacks, so maybe they have a throw off that. But you know, there's they. I thought I think they've done a really good job in terms of finding different ways. I mean, line him up at running back. Uh, mm -hmm just p p tossing him the ball, line, giving him reverses against Utah, jet sweeps. They've done a pretty good job getting in the ball. Would love to see him, you know, and I think this might be also, I think we got to remember when he came on campus, he was not a January guy. So maybe his role in the passing game beyond being kind of an outlet will expand as the season goes on. And I think that can only help because he's just so electric. If you can get him the ball, we saw just when Merch dropped it to him real fast, just get him in the ball in some space with room. I would love to see him kind of catching slants and intermediate plays or RPO stuff where he can catch it on the run and has some room to go. I think he would be uh, pretty tough to stop. So I think just kind of more the traditional passing game would be kind of where I think you're hoping to see his growth because they're trying to manufacture touches for him in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, that's where I was going to go with it because everything in the passing game is on the outside with him. And, yeah. you know, and catching the line of scrimmage and trying to get something. I, I want to see, yeah, li those little mesh routes with him over the middle and he catch and go. Uh, I, yeah, well, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully that's there. Uh, something that's been different in the passing game we saw a little bit, Seth, a couple, last couple of weeks is Montreal Johnson as a lead blocker. Uh, and some of this was with Wilson in the backfield. And, you know, they're, they're trying some new things in the run game. Uh, and a lot of it unearthed itself last week versus Vanderbilt, but we also saw it a couple of times versus South Carolina as, as well. And look, the run game was really good versus Vanderbilt. I thought it was pretty good against South Carolina, yeah, but you found yourself too. you found yourself down 10 points, so you had to pass the ball to get back in it. Uh, but, you know, the, the run game is starting to look a little bit better uh, as well. But this is a new little wrinkle that uh, we give Billy Napier a whole lot of credit for his run game design, and he's still finding new ways that we haven't seen uh, as a Gator head coach. Yeah, I've been begging for 20 personnel since uh, yeah. Dan Mullins last year where they had those backs. <laughs> I was like, if you're going to put your best 11 on the field, that might include uh, you know having two backs out there at one time. Uh, they uh, they did, did it in different ways. They Moving uh, Wilson back there is kind of the second uh, running back, really. But, you know, I would, I, that's another thing. Kind of are they going to go to a true 20 personnel look and put both those backs on the field at the same time? I think the depth at that position may be – stifles that so you can kind of supplement it by putting a guy like Wilson back there with one of your backs. So it's kind of a two back set, but you're not having to worry about putting two guys out on the field at the same time, getting them both reps when you don't have a ton of depth of the position. Uh, but I would love to see some two back stuff. I think it, it can be really interesting. Not a ton of people get into it anymore. Uh, so I think it could give defenses some issues, but uh, that, that'd be something that would be fun, fun little wrinkle to see. Anything else, Will? No, nah, I mean I, I'm I'm up for the two back sets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the the thing I was so you you had in your article I think Seth they had somebody mm -hmm. running a return route on on one of the configurations. I think that was that was your article I was reading. I, I'm yep. wondering whether we'll start seeing that in the red zone a little bit more. Um, you know, they, they haven't really attacked at the wide receiver position, at least down in the red zone. Um, so if you go into those two back sets, you still then have an opportunity maybe to hold the, uh, you know, get some one-on-one -on, -one on the outside. That's sort of where I was kind of maybe heading with with Trey Wilson. You know, do you start trying to put him on the outside, getting him in some one on one configurations, and can you do that by going in a twenty, going into twenty personnel? Yeah, if, I think if you can, especially down low, if you can kind of, if you can kind of establish that you can run the ball out of it, you'll probably see some single coverage. You know, and then uh, that's kind of the other part of the Trey Wilson package: put him back, your running back, and now let him run a variety of routes in the backfield. Now that might be putting a lot on a younger guy, but you know, if you can kind of make that a real part of your package and get him lined up on linebackers and give him an option of sit or break out based on what the guy does, that could be pretty tough too. So uh, I know there was a little bit of that in preseason camp. There was a little bit of it. So I don't, like you said, I don't know how much, I know he was involved in it a little bit too, but I don't, like you said, I don't know how ex extensive it is, but yeah. like you said, I, I think it is there. That would be fun. 
It's Georgia week. Time to break it all out. Yeah, bust it all out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. We need to see something uh, we haven't seen. So, all right, right before we let Seth go here, he's got a, another previous obligation here at 9 o'clock. Um, let's go to the other side for a second, Seth. Florida's defense has had its issues a bit. I know you more from an offensive perspective. If you look at it from an offensive perspective, and now they're facing a little bit more gap gap scheme runs, that's been giving them some issues. Of course, I know Georgia, it's in the playbook. It's going to probably be even more in the playbook now. Bowers is out, so they may even rely on the run game even more. But given what Kentucky has done, what South Carolina did, uh, what Vandy tried to do, but what Georgia probably can do if they put it in the playbook there, you know, what are you looking for from this defense the next couple of weeks and trying to you know solve that issue that they have there? So going back the last few, few games, especially kind of uh, Kentucky and South Carolina, I think, you know, the issues are kind of more on the edge in terms yeah. of fitting stuff up inside. You go back and think of the Kentucky game. There was a couple where they ran some like long trap and kind of kicked a guy that was more inside, but there wasn't a ton of like a gap runs. So, you know, running on either side of the center, or not even a ton of just outside the guard. A lot of it was more kind of tackle out more perimeter runs, some of it zone, some of it gap. And then, a good bit of those going back into the boundary, which I think that's a spot that may be a weakness, not in terms of personnel, but in terms of scheme at times is going back to the boundary of, of this style of defense. Um, especially if you're going to rotate your nickel over on top of a receiver to the other side, you, you kind of have, uh, if you're going to play two high safeties, you got the corner rolled up and then your safety is back deep linebackers tucked in the box. So there's not really anybody outside that edge player over there. So if you can kick him out and now you can wrap up for the linebacker to the back side, that, that makes it a little bit tougher. So, you know, I, I just, I think a lot of the problems in the uh, against the run have been kind of fitting up runs aggressively from the second and third levels. I think there's been some misfits there. And then, you know, I, I think you're kind of getting beat up on the edges a little bit because you're not huge there. You're, you've got a couple guys that, have some twitch but you don't have a ton of size out on the edge so they're making you take on blocks and uh you know try to how are you going to play you're going to you're going to box it turn it back inside you're going to spill it let your guys run over the top uh i thought they did better as the game went on against kentucky but that kind of caught them early and caught them a few times out of position or just not i think expecting to have to take on a, a puller uh but i'm sure they'll be working it in the bye week especially back in the boundary. I think steams are attacking there. This seems like to me. Yeah. I mean, you know, in this one, obviously I don't think you're like deathly afraid of Rattler keeping the ball on the backside. Um, so, you know, is there a, is there a way to maybe get more penetration on the defensive line? Cause it seems like, especially up front, like, you know, two, three times a game, you usually see like a defensive lineman find his way in when there's yeah. a pulling guard, right? You, you sort of shoot that gap and you find your way in. Have they been trying that and they just haven't been able to hit or are the guys not getting off fast enough to be able to get through that gap and, and get the tackle for loss? They got one early, uh, against South Carolina. They, uh, they they had a good they had a tough front for what South Carolina wanted to do and you ended up having a nose over the center who almost kind of had to try to block back uh, to your three tech or back there and he wasn't able to make the play and Florida just blew it up in the backfield I think it was the second play of the game for South yeah. Carolina but yeah I, I think this is this group is stout in the middle I don't think this is a group that's shooting gap like this not that's not really their game it's not like you have a Warren Sapp type guy that can just shoot a gap as a three tech and and is really tough I think they're more kind of big bodies push the pocket hold up at the line of scrimmage hold blockers off their linebackers type of guys and when you can kind of double team those guys uh, and get down blocks it takes away some of their effectiveness. And I think that's what teams are trying to do. And just kind of being like, we'll just live out on the edge and make your edge guys, your young secondary guys and your young linebackers have to make all the plays. All right. Well, that'll do it for Seth. I'm glad it was kind of short notice. We put this together. Glad he was able to uh, 
Hop on here on Gators Breakdown today. Check his article out at GatorsBreakdown.com, Scheming with Seth. Check his film reviews out at Varnador Films right here on YouTube as well. I think he said the Gator one was going to be up today. or It's up now. Yeah. It's up now. like an go. hour and a half long because there's a there's a lot of consequential plays in that game. I was trying to cut and cut and cut, and it was like, well, i got to keep that one. Now i got to keep this one. So <laughs> it's a little long. but Good good uh, stuff, guys. Yeah. If you want more, Seth, deep dive in there for Florida, South Carolina film review. Varnador Films right there on YouTube. Hey, Seth, thanks so much, man. Hey, no problem. Thanks, guys. All right, there we go. Seth joining us right here on Gators Breakdown. And hey, good stuff. Good stuff there, Will. And uh, hey, we got plenty more to talk about. We'll look forward a little bit right here on this episode of Gators Breakdown. But before we do, when all your money is on the line, trust us, trust us, choose a trusted sports book that gives you the tools to win, like at my bookie. At my bookie, it doesn't matter if your team is up or down. You can easily cash out or bet the game live to come out on the winning side. Use my bookie for daily odds boost, same game parlays, and take advantage of huge prize pool contest. Plus, my bookie has a no strings attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Just use promo code Gators on your first deposit and receive up to two hundred dollars in cash. That's Gators to claim your own cash bonus now. Try the my bookie money bag to grab a potential Super Bowl front runner at long shot odds plus thirty eight thousand on the Eagles and Chiefs. You won't find odds like that anywhere else. So go bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with my bookie. All right, Will. Yeah, I mean, first time you and I uh, get together after the the big comeback win right there for Florida, the fourth quarter storm back right there against South Carolina in Columbia, that road, road victory. Seth, uh, you know, deep dive in there in, into stuff and what, Florida's been doing good the last couple of games, what they were doing good last Saturday. Uh, but, man, big, big win right there for the Gators. And uh, it was uh, was looking bleak, looking very, very bleak on the road once again in that fourth quarter. But the Gators found their way and found a way to get a victory. You're on mute, Will. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> every, time, every time there's Ned Reed, got to remember to do that. Um, so F- Florida, I mean, when it was 37, 27, I think we were all clinching a little bit there, uh, wondering, you know, four and three heading into a bye week, heading into Georgia, um, hadn't looked real impressive, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So to get a couple of really big stops there on the defensive side, to be able to get the ball back, all those fourth down conversions. I mean, Florida ends up this game with four of 15 on third down. Yep. They started out three of four, which means they were one for 11. <laughs> they, they scored two touchdowns in the fourth quarter to win the game without converting one third down. They were over three on third down on those two drives, converted a bunch of fourth downs. Obviously that's probably not sustainable long-term, but, the reality is, is you got done what you needed to get done in this one. And and South Carolina's defense, not good. Um, and we saw that, right? We saw the holes there, but Florida was able to take advantage of it. And I've been about as I've been as critical of Graham Mertz as just about anybody out there. He was great in this one. I mean, and he sacrificed completion percentage in this one to go downfield. He averaged 8.8 yards per throw, which is other than Charlotte and McNeese, is his highest of the year. Um, he aver- he also he only threw he only completed 63% of his passes. The big thing to me is he, he averaged 14.1 yards per completion and he was at 10 and a half for the year and in the game against Vanderbilt he was at eight and a half. So just the idea that he was more aggressive going downfield. Seth mentioned that he seemed more aggressive. It wasn't just that he seemed more aggressive. He was more he aggressive. Was. Right? Like <laughs> he and and the throw he made to Mizell that that Seth mentioned was interesting because it was essentially the exact same play that they ran for the touchdown to Pearsall, but Mizell ran straight and didn't get the guy to bend outside. So Pearsall's route running pays off there and they didn't have the pump fake, right? They didn't hold or they didn't move that safety over by having that pump fake. They added the pump fake there on the last play and, and Mertz executed it perfectly. Um, I thought the fourth down completion to Pearsall that he had, that was what, like fourth and 11 after the false start, um, they got immediate pressure and he saw the pressure coming in a way that he didn't against Kentucky. When yeah. Kentucky brought pressure off the edge, Mertz got absolutely just, I mean, he, he got flushed from the pocket and sacked in a way where, you know, worst case, like best case scenario would have just been flailing the ball into the stands if the same thing had happened. Instead, he saw the corner come and made him miss, got outside. And at that point, he had the one-on-one coverage, was able to hit Pearsall. Um, you know, I, I said it earlier a little bit jokingly, but it's true that the fourth down conversions gloss over some of the imperfections in the game. Um, and and this is an offense that needs high level third down conversions. They didn't get it in this game, which is why they were down 37 to 27 to begin with. But you know what? I mean, 
look, when when you're struggling on the road and you're trying to sort of establish who you are to show the kind of toughness that the team showed. I mean, that defense got got blown all over the place the entire game, got stops when they had to. Mertz got 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 slammed a few times in that game to a point where you were sitting there wondering whether he was going to get up. Um, missed a few throws as well, but that's not the, and that, there you go on that point too. I mean, Florida did try to go deep early and it wasn't and it wasn't there, but they did keep going at it. Well, so yeah. there's a couple things there. One is that when you start attempting to do it then the defense starts to back off a little bit. It gives you sort of those dig routes underneath. It gives you the ability to throw the ball out to boarding him in the flat and have him turn, you know, a four yard gain into a into a 12 yard gain because the guys have to back off. The other thing is is if you're going to play man coverage against somebody like that, you got to go after it. You can't just sit there and go, okay, we're going to run hitches. It doesn't work, right? <laughs> you're yep. going to have to run um, not a smash concept because that's usually a hitch with a corner, but they were running slants with corners. Seth did a really nice job of showing that in his article over gagesbreakdown.com. And to have that route combo against single coverage is going to open up that deep shot if you know if it, if it's run right and you're going to have the opportunity to take it. Mertz took it this time and there have been times where he's had one-on-one coverage and he just hasn't taken it. And and the thing the thing that I think sort of exemplifies his play in the entire game is the deep throw to Khalil Jackson cuz Trey Wilson was wide open underneath. <laughs> and I mean if he gets that ball to Wilson it's it's a 14 18 20 yard gain. Instead he decides to take the shot and that was a tough play for Khalil Jackson. And, you know, it wasn't like that thing was wide open. And I mean, it was a right. flood, right? They had all these mm -hmm. guys. That he's, he's choosing low, middle, high. Middle was something he was going to have to fit in there. High was a deep shot, but was probably there. But it had to be a really good throw. And then low was just a sure thing. And he eschewed the sure thing and went for it. And I think you don't always want your quarterback going for it. But in this case, that makes complete sense. Because if you make a bad throw, all right, the ball falls harmlessly to the ground and you live to fight another day, that's okay. The thing you want to avoid is, is throwing a ton into double coverage, just going deep to go deep, right? If the defense is saying, we're going to stay back and make you take stuff underneath, then take it underneath. But that's not what South Carolina was doing. South Carolina was daring them to throw deep. And finally, Florida decided to take advantage of that. Yeah, well, and one thing I, I I like to, and what it came down to in that last drive, you know, Florida, and maybe somewhat surprisingly, didn't get conservative on that last drive. You were down by three, could have easily maybe tried. Look, don't get me wrong; most coaches know on the road. Yeah, you go, you go play for the victory. You go play for the road, and, and given how this offense has played, and maybe given how Billy Napier has coached sometimes, I. Was a little surprised to see Florida so aggressive. Uh, and you scored that winning touchdown on, well, man, what was it, second 11? Uh, I, I think it was. You, you do that, then, I mean, you're already behind the sticks a little bit. You could have easily chose, with the way Smack was playing, you could have easily, okay, we believe in our field goal kicker. We will try to run this clock out. You know, let's go to overtime and take our chances there. No, I love the aggression. I love the belief he had in Mertz. But the, the belief Mertz had in his teammates, like Pierce Hall, to go make a play like that. I mean, to have that aggression, to go 75 yards on the last two drives of the game. But I love the aggression on that last play to go out there and get the victory. Well, he had watched his defense that game, so that probably <laughs> dictated that he wanted to be aggressive. Uh, this one reminded me of the Tennessee game last year, right? Yeah. That game was one where Florida was behind, where Florida knew every time they got the ball they had to score because the defense wasn't stopping Tennessee at all. Um, it felt the same way in this one. Um, the defense managed to get a couple of stops when Florida was down 10, and all of a sudden Florida has an opportunity. You know, uh, the fourth down to, to, to Boardingham is the one that I think most people remember, mainly because it was the dump off. But the fourth down where they threw the toss, right? Where they had Merch come, when play. they had Merch come up yeah. like he was gonna like he was gonna QB sneak it, and then they throw the toss. That does that's there's two things there. One, the announcers were like, they're bringing on the field goal unit, and I was about to launch my F bomb <laughs> so hard if he didn't go for it on fourth down there and took the field goal on fourth and one just from an analytics perspective but the problem florida's had all year and really the offensive line has some holes and there's no doubt but the big problem the offensive line has had is not it's down to down consistency blocking in the run game the pro if you look at like line yards which is like how many yards the offensive line has actually generated it's pretty comparable to last year the place where they really have struggled is things like stuff rate Mm -hmm. and and power rush success like they just have not been very good there and so those third and twos those fourth and ones those are ones where they, they're not able to get the yard 
going straight up the middle. So in a critical situation where you need the fourth down, they recognize that, throw the toss, get ETN to the outside, and all of a sudden you've got stuff open. It's funny, a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about how to fix the offense, that was one of the things I pointed to was toss the ball to the running backs to give them some space because what's happening is they're getting hit so close to the line of scrimmage that they have to dance before they ever get to the line of scrimmage and you're getting a bunch of negative plays. Get the ball out on the edge and that should open things up and that's exactly what they did there. So I thought Napier called this game really aggressively. I think obviously the missed extra point for South Carolina really sort of completely changed both them having to come back down the field down four, but also I think their defense was playing we don't want to let Florida get closer for a field goal, right? You don't play single high safety and yeah. and and blitz and and man to man and all that sort of stuff if you're up if you're up four in that circumstance, you're sitting there going, I'm going to make Mertz beat me underneath. But since they were only down three, you're trying to prevent them from getting closer and closer and closer into field goal range. And it gave Florida the opportunity to take the shot. I think, you know, in many ways, that's the story is Florida finally took the the shots that the defense was giving them on a consistent basis. There have been times where defenses have just played coverage and the right play is to dump it underneath and, and, and have a 14 play drive and just be really consistent and go downfield. But when the defense gives you an opportunity to take the shot, you got to take it. And they had Pierce on the exact right spot for that last play. Mertz knew what he had. He was not going left. They were running a double route that way to make the safety think they were doing that. That ball was going to Pierce all from the time it was snapped. They knew it. They had the right configuration, and you know they'd worked on that. And um, that's sort of, you know, Seth, I, I love Seth's article. Talk. I can't remember what the exact phrase was, but um, essentially putting your plan in practice. Um, that's, that's something that, you know, they ran and they looked at that perfect position, perfect opportunity, perfect defense, take the shot and hit it and merch, put it right on his hands. Now, obviously there's some luck involved, right? You got the fourth down to boarding him. You got the tip ball for boarding. Him. You've, you've got the tip ball that Trey Wilson pulls in that, you know, nine times out of 10, I mean, it's either falling on the ground or the defense gets the interception on something like that, where you throw the ball behind them. Um, you know, even the one they threw up to Mizell, the, there was an opportunity there for South Carolina to get that ball as an interception. And, and Mizell was able to knock the ball out of his hands. And so Florida at least was able to live another day on that one. Um, have the block field goal as well, sort of put them in a tough spot. Cause when they were coming down, down the field, down three, it's like, man, it'd be really nice to have that field goal right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Trace Mack did a really nice job. That one wasn't necessarily his fault. So all in all, a very solid performance for Florida. Yeah, speaking of that one, Drew, well, before you leave off with smack, man, just the whole team, and I saw it put in the chat too, but that field goal right before halftime, special teams didn't look lost. You didn't have two guys wearing the same number on the field goal team coming out and trying to kick this field goal right before halftime. I mean, hey, it looked like a competent special teams effort there on the road when they absolutely needed it. Well, it turns out the uh, the ire of the fan base, while sometimes overbearing, does tend to get results. <laughs> like you, you tend to, uh, at some point, people are like, "Just stop yelling at me!" And uh, you know, I, I look. I think uh, there's no doubt these guys know how to coach football. The right. question is, and and this was sort of my point coming out of the Utah game, is it looked like they were spending so much time with the basics that things that we consider the basics they really hadn't gotten to yet and in many ways that's the that's the ire of having freshmen and sophomores out there extensively right i mean the the i can't remember who it was put out the put out the metric before the game against south carolina that florida had played the most true freshman mm -hmm. in the country um you know it's not it's not a coincidence that they're making mistakes as well now yeah so maybe the, all these right before halftime drives and late game drives they're taking so long because well you got a lot of youth, youthful faces, faces out there. Yeah. On the flip side, now we got to start yelling at Austin Armstrong because the defense <laughs> gave up 7.4 yards per play and nine explosives to South Carolina. Um, and, and look, I mean, most games, and if you go look, college football data has got some really cool stats where they look at like post game win expectancy based on the stats, and it's like 86% South Carolina. Mm. Is, is what that one sits at. So Florida's pretty fortunate to get it out of this one with a win. I think we all know that Florida's pretty fortunate to get out of this one with a win, but it doesn't matter. You still get out of it with a win. And I think, you know, getting out of that with a win 
and hopefully using that to build momentum. The, the, you know, I said this, this reminded me of the Tennessee game last year. It also reminded me of that 2018 game against South Carolina, where mm-hmm. there was that weird fourth down conversion where the ball was snapped over Felipe Frank's, Frank's head. He runs back, picks it up off the ground, throws the ball off of, I think it was Kamori Gamble's helmet. And then it pops up to Javon Grimes who catches it behind the first down marker and just basically like plows his way for a first down. And Florida was down like 31 to 10 at that time or 31 to 14, something like that. And then all of a sudden something clicked and the Gators came back and won that game. And the offense looked completely different from that day on. And that's going to be the question, right? Is the question is going to be, can, and this has been the question in the entire Napier Napier era is, can you string those things together week after week after week in, in Mullen's first year, they were able to do it, but they also had a lot of experience on that team. This team doesn't have the experience. The question will be, does this give them the confidence and sort of the moxie to be able to push this forward against some of the opponents who are coming up? There we go. Hey, Will, nice transition. Will it continue here for the Gators? Hey, look, we knew we talked about it beforehand. It was going to get easier. You were going against the defenses of Vanderbilt and South Carolina where you should have been able to take advantage, and Florida did. And now it needs to translate. Can they take the the building blocks of giving getting successful performances versus the likes of Vanderbilt and South Carolina? Two of the worst defenses they'll play this season, of course, in, in conference play, you know, it was the run against Vandy going for 215 yards and the rushing leading the way. And then the passing game carries the offense for a win against South Carolina. You know, for now for the first time by gaining 423 yards uh, in the air. So the last two weeks will have shown Florida could get it done either way. And now we have to ask ourselves what it means moving forward. You know, p- play two of the easier defenses they'll play this season. Certainly two of the worst getting in the conference play credit for bringing it along and now we need to see it translate to the rest of the season and maybe make up going to your point for a defense that's now given up yards and points as well so now moving forward will i mean look vanderbilt 121st scoring defense south carolina is the 104th scoring defense georgia on the docket the number nine scoring defense in the country so you just went from 121 to 104 back to back now to the number nine scoring defense in the country. Arkansas, 64. LSU, 107. So around that Vanderbilt, South Carolina mark. Missouri, 66. Florida State, 21st. And that's going back, Will, also Utah was the fifth. Tennessee was the 16th. Given what you did against Tennessee, probably still the best performance of the season. Uh, And Kentucky, 51st in scoring defense. So it is going to get harder coming up. No defense that really stands out besides Georgia, maybe Florida State as well. Uh, left left on the docket, but with Arkansas, the 64th scoring defense, LSU 107, Missouri 66. If you are taking those steps, if you are using these games that you just had where you had some success as building blocks, we should see it against these defenses coming up. Even though they are improved, you hope your offense is improving at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean, they're going to have to because um, given who's coming up on the offensive side of the ball, I think that's the stuff that worries me less than the defense. Look, I think the the reason the South Carolina win was so important is because the Arkansas win is one, the Arkansas game is one that we should, if this team does what it's supposed to do, we should be able to pencil in for a win, which means you got to six and you're kind of playing for house money after you get to six in those final four, right? Obviously, if you're six and six at the end, it'll sort of be like, oh, God, like, you know, we really should have really would have wanted to get to seven at the same time. I think setting expectations, it really is one game against Arkansas and the rest of them. I think Florida will probably be the underdog in. And the nice part is LSU, like you mentioned that they're not going to see defenses worse than Vanderbilt and South Carolina. Oh no, they will. LSU's defense is <laughs> way worse than those two. LSU's defense is like really close to the worst defense in the country. Um, so, you know, they should be able to get reasonably healthy against them. Arkansas's defense, not great shakes either. Um, you, you start combining those things and and I think they'll probably be able to move the ball. I think the challenge for the second half of the year is going to be on the defensive side of the ball. I think that's really the place mm-hmm. where Florida has regressed over the last few weeks. Um, I think that people have started to figure out what they can do with Florida's defensive line. Florida's not getting any pressure up front. I think they got 11 sacks for the entire year. So our over under got completely torched. <laughs> I think we had like what 37 sacks or something was the over under you had set this year, something like that. They okay, they were close to that. So when I look overall, I think the offense is going to be okay. I don't think the offense is going to be fantastic. I think 
what's going to make or break Florida's ability to pull off one of these upsets is going to be they're going to have to start getting more pressure. They're going to start getting turnovers or just the defense is going to have to be more consistent on a play on a down by down basis. Yeah, the pressure and turnovers. I mean, I think those things are going hand in hand. Um, you know, lack of pressure, and of course, I think we're seeing lack of turnovers because of that. And uh, man, yeah, it does just seem like a struggle there. Um, a little bit surprising. It's so tough for this defense to get turnovers. Um, defensive line, I said, you know, it, it said brought up a good point. Not necessarily the middle so much, but you know, the edges being tested, the edges. Uh, still, once again, has kind of been a bugaboo for when these gap schemes and uh, these successful running offenses that we've played the last couple of years that always seems to be the edge yeah, right? that, that, that's given Florida some troubles and, and not consistent play there. Uh, one thing you said earlier, Will, and I, and I will say yeah, credit for those guys for sticking up at the very end of the game uh, too. I mean, that was, that was huge. Uh, they absolutely had to do it. Uh, and even that, what the next to last drive, it looked like South Carolina had something going. They had some favorable uh, first plays in that drive, but the defense still stood up and did their part. So, yeah, we'll see what they can come up with during the bye week as well. You know, I'm sure Austin Armstrong is going to pound them over the head with gap scheme, gap scheme, gap scheme uh, over the next two weeks. But, you know, we'll, we'll see where it gets. I was hoping the Kentucky performance was just an outlier, but now I think what we've seen the last couple of weeks as well, probably not so much of an outlier as we hoped it would be. Yeah, I, I think so. First off, yes, absolutely. They stepped up in the fourth quarter. Uh, there was a there were two plays I had in my post game recap article. One where they sort of got blown off the ball on an explosive real early in the game, where Anderson didn't even get touched until he was thirty yards downfield, and then they ran very much a very similar concept where Tyreek Sapp was able to chase him down from behind on the first down after the roughing the passer penalty that sort of put the ball at midfield. There you go. Yeah. Set them up for second and twelve. Then they ran the end around that was successful earlier in. The game and Jay Dunhill did a great job of setting the edge and making sure that he got there. I think Seth actually had that in his article. So the combination of those two, um, the combination of those two plays set him up for a third and long, and then Rattler just sort of threw it short. They were able to make the tackle, and all of a sudden Florida gets the ball back. So the defense was able to step up when it could. I, I think, or when it had to, I, I think the, there are a couple problems here. One is that the the average QB rating of the teams that Florida's played so far is 133. The average QB rating of the teams that Florida's about to play is 166 or 167. So the quarterbacks are about to go from meh to good. And South Carolina is the only guy that Florida's played that had a QB rating up over 150. And Vanderbilt, Ken Seals, is at 150. And I think that's a little bit of a mirage because of who they've played so far with Seals. Um, so Florida has faced a lot of quarterbacks who are limited and has still given up a lot of big plays. And against South Carolina, Rattler was really able to just sort of tear them apart, especially when they played zone. Like they played some cover three where the where the wide receivers were getting behind the zone. Rattler was hitting them right as they cleared that zone and wide open, big plays, explosive plays down the field. So I think they're going to have to clean that up. And I'm not sure they're necessarily going to be able to always clean that up. And then the other thing was what I mentioned with Seth is they need to get some more penetration up front. And mm -hmm. it, whether you call that penetration where you get like a yard or two in the, behind the line of scrimmage or whether it's just holding the line on all the explosive run plays, if you go look at the defensive tackles, they are getting double teamed and they're getting knocked back two or three yards. And what that does is it it completely obscures the linebacker's ability to get into that gap, right? You got to hold better at the point of attack. And, you know, we talked all offseason about that front seven and really specifically the defensive tackles being a key to what they were going to be able to do. When Florida is getting gashed on the ground, it's because the defensive tackles are not being able to hold up. Now, look, it's hard to hold up against a double team. That's a tough job. But that's what needs to happen is they need to be a little bit more consistent. Hold that double team. Don't allow the guy to run a combo block and get to the linebacker. Or even, you know, there was a there were a couple of plays where the defensive tackle got blown back so far. The linebacker had to run around him to get to where he needed to be because he was driven back. Um, so, so the linebacker couldn't even slide over into the hole. You have that kind of push up front, and it doesn't matter whether your defensive end holds the edge. doesn't matter whether you've got sap on one end crashing down. And I think that was the thing that I saw really sort of – that's what I think they did better in the second half. I think the defensive tackles were able to hold their ground better, which meant that even you know, even if, even if a guy was a little bit out of his gap or something, it was a six-yard run rather than a 30-yard run because it wasn't just free reign to run right through some giant gaping hole. And, you know, they had that problem against Kentucky. They had that problem early on against South Carolina. Um, 
but considering that the quarterbacks are about to get a lot better, um, I'm that is the place where I'm worried. Like the place yeah. where I'm the most worried is that we're just going to be in a bunch of shootouts like we were last year with Anthony Richardson. And Richardson obviously has, I mean, regardless of what we saw from Mertz, I think Richardson from an explosivity standpoint is a more dynamic player than Mertz. I don't think that's breaking news to anybody. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that actually – it's funny because Florida went down, scored with seven nothing. Then South Carolina comes back to even it up, and I think it was like ten to seven at the end of the first half or at the end of the first quarter. And I was like, "Hey, it's the first time we've been on the road, and we haven't been in throw it like we have to throw it like after the first quarter." And they still threw the ball forty something times, forty point forty eight times in this game. But uh, but hey, I'm giving them a lot more credit for finally winning a game for throwing over more than thirty attempts than last week because the last week was a lot of those shovel passes. This yeah. was. Over 40 passes, full-fledged, you know, great passing look, game. Yeah. I, look, I, I thought Merce was great in this one. And again, yeah. I, I've been I've been critical of him. I have my own proprietary stats that do not look favorably upon the things that he's done um, compared to compared to QB rating. But even even, my, even that stat said he was really good in this one. Um, he he was great. And you know, all season long, I've sort of said that Mertz isn't the problem, but he isn't the solution. He was the solution in this one. Yes, like Florida doesn't win that game without Graham Mertz, and and it's good, good that they have that level of player back there. But I think if the defense is going to make him score forty points a game, yeah, this team isn't going to win a whole lot of games. Like you, it was funny. I think I, I picked Florida thirty-one to twenty-one, and a bunch of people in my comments are like. Where are we going to get 31 points, Will? Like, where's that coming from? <laughs> hey, <laughs> and I'm I, like, I predicted 27, and I was still asking myself the question, but I was like, okay, I'll, don't kick a few field goals in this one. Well, so it turns out I, I originally had it 24 17, and then I looked at the Vegas over under, and it was 52 and a half. And I'm like, they're never wrong. Like, they're never wow. wrong. <laughs> so then I went back and looked, and I'm like, yeah, they, like, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> South Carolina's defense is that bad. Like it's really bad. And it turns out Florida's is too. And that, and that's that's the prop. Florida's now 97th in the country against FBS opponents in yards per play allowed. Um Oof. and and in this one, I mean, you know, for for all of the laudits for the Florida offense, they only at only average 6.1 yards per play. That'd be like 24th, 25th overall in the season. South Carolina was 7.4. That'd be fourth. So, you know, normally you would have expected this one to be more like 45 to 38 South Carolina and Florida's defense got the turnover. Florida's defense was able to, to sort of, it was funny because it was either South Carolina just ripped down the field in four or yeah. five plays, or it was a three and out. <laughs> like there wasn't a whole lot of in between there, there, there weren't a whole lot of like seven yard passes and then 12 yard passes. It was either 50 yards or punt <laughs> and, and they just got the punt at the right time. Yeah, I was going through and looking at Mario Anderson. You know, I brought up the run game there. And he, his 30-yard carry was the second carry of the game for him, Will. But besides that, he would have had 19 carries for 68 yards. And that's pretty good. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I usually go against myself when I say, oh, well, th that, that play does count. That 30-yard run counts. So you can't erase it. But you know, we were actually talking about, you know, did they adjust? Did they make an improvement? And they kind of actually did. I mean, uh, he had a 12-yard run two plays later, but then nothing else to the second half and a 13-yard run. So they did that 30-yard run, you know, was huge, and, and it got South Carolina on the board early. But, uh, you know, I – Watching it live, it, it felt worse. Uh, but when you go back and look at it, you know the, the, the rushing attack for South Carolina wasn't there uh, all game long like you know Kentucky was <laughs> to, the two weeks before that. Well, and and the way that the way South Carolina was attacking Florida meant that one they kind of got away from the run game and yeah. two wouldn't you have gotten away from the run game if you'd have been able to torch defensive backs like that yeah like, i mean they were just tormenting them and part of that as well there was a lot of man-to-man -man coverage for florida too you had uh you had jalen kimber out there and man-to-man -man a couple times in a row it's funny that big play that uh that kimber gave up but then was able to tackle the guy at like the five Leggett, i think it was at the five and then the next play, they threw it out in the flat. Kimber comes up and makes a huge tackle to make it, you know, like first and goal from the seven or eight. And that forces South Carolina to kick a field goal. So even though they – and this was one of the big differences in the game – is Florida's defense, for the most part, has given up explosives that are touchdowns, right? It's like you think about the Tennessee game. Every time they gave up an explosive, it went for a touchdown. And the Kentucky game, every time they gave up an explosive, it felt like it went for a touchdown. 
there wasn't the longest play they gave up was 46 yards. Now they did give up a 45 and a 41 yard play too, but there weren't a ton of plays where like there wasn't a 75 yarder. There wasn't the 80 yarder. There wasn't the one we saw against Utah, the one we saw against Kentucky. They were at least able to stop them and force them into field goals. And, you know, that's not great. You would love to not give up the explosive, but to be able to stop them in those situations, I think at least, um, you know, shows some growth on that side of the ball, but look, they're struggling. They are absolutely struggling. And part of that is that they're not getting any pressure with the front four. And part of that is that, that, you know, they, they just are not able to cover on the back end. Like, like you'd want them to for the, for the man to man stuff that Austin Armstrong wants to do. And, uh, you know, so then he then he drops into zones, and the zones are pretty wide because they don't they don't get any pressure up front. So it's going to be a long second half of the season unless they figure out a way to get to the quarterback. And look, Human Meelan made a huge play with that sack before the half gets the ball back over to Florida. Florida gets a field goal. Yep. You know, I'm sitting there going, "Oh God, it's the last four minutes of the first half. Like, what's going <laughs> on?" And South Carolina gets the ball to start the second. Like, it could have very easily been like ten point a ten point lead for South Carolina. Um, or I guess a seven point lead for South Carolina heading into the heading into or coming out of that first drive of, of halftime. Instead, it's a tie ball game because South because Car- Florida kicks a field goal after they get it back after the human meal and sack. So certainly timely, uh, you know, they were able to step up timely and get pressure, but they're, they're going to need to put a lot more pressure on the quarterbacks who are coming up on the schedule. Yeah, that was huge. Um, you know, get that Florida was Florida was winning by three at halftime oh, with, with that. So and then it was tied coming out of the first drive yeah. and then Florida mm-hmm. came down I think and made another field goal to go up 3. So you right. think about the you think about the last four of the first and that middle eight. Yeah. I think Florida ends up plus 3 in that plus middle three. eight. I'm yeah. I'm not sure Florida won the middle eight in any game last year. Uh, we we uh, tracked it. I forgot the with that, but we did track it. Yeah, to, definitely we'll go back and compare again. I think they were up middle eight in the Vanderbilt game as well. Um so yeah, better Better there for sure. But hey, you know, to answer the question, you know, of course, offense making progress. Will it continue? Um, I think look, I, I still got my doubts it continues versus Georgia <laughs> in a couple of weeks. But hey, after that, Arkansas I, can be had. Their defense can be had. LSU, certainly their defense can be had. That game is on the road. Missouri on the road. Uh, they've been giving up a lot of points lately as well to LSU, to Kentucky this past week, uh, and then Florida State, you know, kind of Different comparison there with who they play. You know, they're they're in the ACC. We'll get a lot better. They play North Carolina coming up, so we'll get a lot better gauge of where that Florida State defense as well. But uh, the the offense is getting better. Um, I think they're starting to show some balance as well. Uh, But then we'll 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 see how much better is to to Will's point. How much better they need to be uh, with this defense, and hopefully they come around after this bye week as well. So. All right, well, what you guys got going on at uh, Read and Reaction and Stand Up and Holler, all that good stuff over there at readreaction.com. Yeah, so we'll have a celebratory podcast this week to go over the uh, go over the win over South Carolina. Can't be can't be too negative about it because you know if you'd have told me five and two before the season started yeah. going to the Georgia game, I would have taken it in a heartbeat. So Florida's there, and how they got there is irrelevant. And uh, and and so you know, look, I mean, this is it's funny heading into the Georgia game. They have an opportunity to be first in the SEC East if they can shock the world and pull that game off. Do we expect it? No. But that's kind of what makes it fun, right? If you pull it off all of a sudden. Um, so we'll be looking at I, I'm going to be able to take a deep dive at Georgia a little bit in the next week. So the yeah. preview next week should be cool. And then the other thing is, I, I'm pretty sure people have seen it, but DJ Lagway is absolutely torching people right now. He is so there. So there will probably be something up on the site this week looking at Lagway, how he compares to some other recruits who've come in. And uh, put it this way, um, some of his statistics compare favorably with guys like, you know, Caleb Williams. <laughs> There you go. You, we, we always look at uh, high school can, uh, completion percentage. I know is a big one and all that, but uh, has usually tracked pretty well uh, when looking at uh, college performance as well. So yeah, Will, just not worse this go, year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I will say, uh, kind of going to your early point before we sign off here on this episode. Look, I always look forward to Florida, Georgia. It's my favorite game, my favorite day of the year for the first time. And look, I, I'm not dreading I'm not I'm not dreading the game and what I think the outcome will be. I'm I'm gonna pick Georgia to win. That's not gonna be a you know spoiler alert or anything. I think most people will even realistic opinions, but uh I do think there's more of a shot than you know the, the than 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 last year going into last year's game, and certainly two years ago where you know kind of the wheels were falling off. Uh and Anthony Richardson gets his first start in, in that and 
the, the fan base kind of got excited for that 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 day. But then, then last year, you didn't really know what to expect in Billy Napier's first year going against uh, you know the best team in the country. But you know, even before the Bowers injury news, there, you know, just kind of you know Florida figuring some things out. Georgia hasn't been able to. You know, besides Kentucky, really blow the doors off of anybody this year. So hopefully we can go to Jacksonville a bit and, and, and give those Bulldogs a game. Yeah, I'll be interested to look into Georgia's offense. I haven't had an opportunity to really look too heavily in there other than I watched the first half against South Carolina and got really happy, and then they did blow the doors off South Carolina in the second, in the second half, half of that one yeah. when they finally cared. Um, I, I think that's actually the biggest danger for Georgia is that, you know, just – None of these guys have lost to Florida, right? I mean, the last mm. the last time Florida beat them was 2020, and not a lot of them are still around from then. And they're defend, you know, two time defending national champions and and all that stuff. And eventually, the malaise starts to set in. And you know, we were talking before we came on. I was like, I, I think it's probably going to take a game like that 2012 game where Muschamp lost with six turnovers, and you had the Jordan Reed fumble at the end. And you know, you like I think about the Jordan Reed fumble at the end and sort of you know like my my heart just like sinks as i think about it but they had six turnovers in that game and uh you know so i i think that's the kind of thing where you can envision this game's always kind of weird the the two teams on either side it's not really a home game for either team so this isn't like you're really going on the road um obviously kirby smart makes makes all sorts of comments about the game being in jacksonville and how they need to get it closer to athens so that's always fun uh, but, you know, you're, you're sleeping in your own bed for the most part, and then you're taking a bus up to the game. So it's a little bit different than a traditional road game or even a neutral game like a bowl game. So, uh, look, I think Florida has a shot. You look at ESPN, it's like 85-15 is what they have for their FPI. I think that's probably what most people think it is. Yeah. Um, but I think if you'd have asked me what Florida's um, – likelihood of winning the game last year or the year before i think i would have told you it's like 99 to 1 it's like the uh the lloyd uh, gif from <laughs> from, from, <laughs> from yep. dumb and dumber it's like so you're telling me there's a chance it's like no nah, i think with bowers out carson beck can be had he hasn't really been harassed that much um, right the question will be can florida harass him um, what can you put in in two weeks both teams coming off a bye week that is one thing i think that's easy to overlook is that south carolina came into that game and maybe it's the most impressive thing about florida getting that win is south carolina came into that game off a bye week and should have been the fresher team in the fourth quarter and instead florida kicked their butt in the fourth quarter and you think about sort of some of the the hallmarks of the good or at least decent Florida teams over the last five, six, seven years. It's been teams that have been able to really race away in the fourth quarter. And when they've been bad, they haven't been able to do it. That, you know, a lot of those games in 2021, when Mullen lost it, lost, lost a job were one score games where Florida was right in it and just wasn't able to take advantage of it. So now you've each got bye weeks coming in. You've each got extra time to prepare. And, you know, the question I have, and this is where I go back to the Trey Wilson stuff is he's clearly your most dynamic guy on offense. And if you can steal a touchdown because you put something in that they haven't seen on tape and he can take it to the house, all of a sudden you've got an opportunity to sort of put them on their heels. And, you know, irrespective of what the stats say, I do think this Florida defense is better than that South Carolina one. And they were a little bit bored in the first half against South Carolina, wound up down 14 to three came out and, and really blew them off the field, but they don't have Bowers now. And so how does that impact things? I saw somebody today saying, well, this might be the best thing that ever happened to Georgia because without him, they'll have to rely on other people. I'm like, yeah, that's not true. That'd be like if Florida lost Trey Wilson for you know the next six weeks. That that doesn't help our other receivers. Yeah, step up. Georgia may not beat Auburn two weeks ago. If they didn't have Brock Bowers. <laughs> well, and you think about the progress that Carson Beck has made. Most of that progress has been. I'm just going to throw it to the best player in the country and let him roam with the ball. And once he started started really really isolating Bowers. Um, all of a sudden the Georgia offense looked a lot better. Now, look, I mean, Kentucky blew Florida off the field. Georgia blew mm -hmm. Kentucky off the field. So if we're going with transitive properties, uh, okay, doesn't look great. But both of those teams sort of have different MOs, different ways of doing things, and, and I think it's going to be a little bit different kind of game. So I, like you said, I think we're all going to expect Georgia to win. But that's it, – it's funny. 2012 is probably my favorite Florida year of the past, like, mm -hmm. you know, post-national championship years because we didn't expect it. Like they come out and barely pull off, pull off that win against Texas A&M and Johnny football. And then, uh, Tennessee you know, the next week. Yeah. And then, and then you lose the game against Georgia and you're like, oh, everything's sort of down. And then, you know, you, you just, 
absolutely physically maul Florida State. They completely mauled LSU too. They just ran it right down their throat. It was like, oh, like this team has an identity. This is pretty cool. And that's the thing is I'm wondering coming out of the South Carolina game, have they maybe started to build that identity where they're not going to be that smash mouth team that comes out and runs the ball down your throat. They're going to have to go downfield because they're not a running team. And I think maybe the first four or five games of the year, they have been trying to establish their identity as a line of scrimmage running team. And I think in this game against South Carolina, this is screw it. That's not who we are. And let's go do something that's more in line with who we are. And we'll see if it leans more in that direction when they face the Bulldogs. Yeah. I still think more balanced attack is probably what this team is, but uh, Hey, we'll see. Like you said, it would be nice to say, Hey, whatever we need, let's go do that. Maybe that's, maybe that's where this offense can be. They can, they can do both. They can pick and choose. Hey, that's, Really good offenses can do that. <laughs> so we, I don't know if that if, that, if this offense is at that level yet. But, hey, yeah, we've got plenty more to get into with Georgia next week as, as we'll get back together. Um, they are starting to get their run game figured out. They're starting to get healthy there too. So uh, that's that a difference that we haven't seen from this Georgia offense or from earlier this season. So plenty more. Plenty more to get into that one. But uh, it's always – always hate Georgia. Two weeks to prepare, man. It's, it's – uh... Boy, is it good we pulled out that game. <laughs> Just makes everything taste better this week, makes everything feel better this week. And, I mean, there would be zero hope, right? Like, no one would oh, be saying, yeah, we're yeah. going to pull on the upset if you, if if that game had gone the other way. If if Mertz throws a pick at some point in there, if South Carolina comes back and wins it at the end, like, the, the pessimism and the negativity would have been significant, and deservedly so if they'd have wound up to find a way to lose that game after they went back ahead. But, uh, um, but man, what a difference it makes. And so, like I said, five and two coming into the season would have said, yep, sign me up right now, heading into the top cocktail party, five and two, and uh, hopefully they can find a way to get to six and two. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. So, all right, that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. It's Will Miles. You can find him on social media at Will Miles SEC and at readreaction.com. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on social media at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for joining us on this episode of Gators Breakdown.